we actually retired um, in 2015. And at the time that we retired, we were the youngest retirees in Canada. So we were in our uh, 30s, 30 and 31. And um, so our claim to fame is the fact that we became financially independent and retired early without buying a house. These are Christian Bryce from Millennial Revolution. They retired with a million dollars in their early 30s and they've been traveling the world ever since. Their story is incredible, but because the way they've achieved it is so simple, they are actually an example that all of us can follow. In fact, my own journey to FIRE is very similar to theirs. No real estate, simple saving, effective, low-cost index investing for the long term, and that's it. <laughs> so nothing complicated, nothing that you too can replicate. Hello and welcome to the Fire Belgium show. My name is Sebastian Aguilar and I'm here to help you take control of your finances, invest better so that you can live more, be more and give more. In this fascinating interview with Christian Bryce, you will learn about why buying a house could be the worst financial decision you make when you're on the path to financial independence, how to plan for financial independence, how to use geo arbitrage and save money while traveling the world, how powerful and effective index investing can actually be, and how simple it is for anyone to implement. And by the way, if you're interested in learning how to invest in index funds from Belgium, exactly like Christy, Bryce and myself are doing, then I have a free workshop that I have developed especially to help beginners that is available on my website. In this workshop, I explain how you can start investing in a very simple way while optimizing for costs and taxes using an approach that has been proven by decades of academic research to deliver better results than what banks and financial advisors are trying to sell us. Index investing is a very powerful way of investing at a fraction of the costs, and it doesn't take very much time once it's in place. So I highly recommend you check the workshop and start learning right away. Um, I will post the link in the description of this podcast or YouTube video, wherever you are right now. Christy and Bryce are the author of a book called Quit Like a Millionaire. No gimmicks, luck or trust fund required. In this book, they basically share their journey and explain how you too can start investing and building financial independence. Uh, it's an incredible book. I loved it and I recommend it to everyone. <laughs> this interview was actually done uh, during COVID. So I think it was a year and a half or two years ago. And I'm bringing it back to you because it was it was just it was just an amazing interview, an amazing exchange uh, with two amazing people, you know, hilarious people, both of them. You'll see that. They have a really funny sense of humor and um, yeah, we spend a lot of time laughing in this interview, uh, but also we spend a lot of time learning incredible things. So that's it with introduction. <laughs> let's start. Uh, let's continue with Christian Bryce. Let's go. So our claim to fame is the fact that we became financially independent and retired early without buying a house. Um, and when you are living in an expensive city like Toronto, which is like the New York of Canada, uh, everybody is expected to buy a house. If you don't buy a house, you're, you're, uh, your parents will disown you. Everybody will think you're a loser. Um, and if you rent, that's basically like the worst thing that could ever happen, based, pretty much. So the fact that we could actually become retired and become the youngest retirees in Canada, um, it, it caused, when we, our story came out on the newspaper, it's like the CNN of Canada, which is the CBC, it caused a thousand comments of people hating on us because they're saying, oh, you can't possibly do this without buying a house. So you must have gotten the money from your, your rich Hong Kong dad, must have bought it for you or somebody must have gave you all this money and uh, like all of this is a complete lie there's no way that you can become early retired um, there's no such thing without buying a house so basically our claim to fame is we retired early and uh, did it without buying a house and uh, we've been traveling the world for the last five years until the pandemic hit and so um, we've actually been stuck in Canada since March so this is the longest time we have not traveled anywhere for the last five years I forgot about that CDC thing. At the time, yeah. it was more widely shared than um, the, our Prime Minister's Canada Day address. So screw you, Trudeau. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I love the story because I basically followed your path. Uh, I don't know if I told you guys, but when we were in Dubai and in the struggling with this 
you know, figuring out how we're going to make it financially. Um, we we came across your your blog, obviously, and I remember um, we were in bed with my wife, and I came across your blog, and then I just wouldn't stop reading until practically the morning, I think, because <laughs> but really, really, really late. And then she does the next morning. She asked me like, "What's happening?" Normally, you know, normally I sleep okay. Um, and I, I just, I, I told her, I found ex- the people who are just ahead of us by just a few years and they're doing it exactly the way we're doing it, um, which is, you know, without, without buying anything, without buying a house, not buying anything, <laughs> but uh, so excited. Um, and I did hesitate to send you a message saying, you know, you guys need to come to Dubai because we have, we were building already a community back then in Dubai. Right. Um, and I wanted to invite you. I don't know what happened. I think I just, you know, work just happened, but uh, uh, yeah. So <laughs> like I'm a super fan of your approach because that's how we did it too. No, no house. And in Belgium, it is a strange thing too. So uh, I think people will relate to your story here in the sense that um, the message is as as shocking here as it is in Canada. <laughs> wow. So tell us a bit about that. Like what 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 happened? How come? Why is it important? Or why was it that not buying a house was such an important part of your journey? Yeah. So actually, originally, I was actually very brainwashed by the the housing herd that we call here. And back then, I basically like right after we got married, um, I wanted to buy a house. That was like what I needed to do in the beginning in order to be accepted by everyone. And my parents were telling me to buy a house and all this stuff. Um, So we actually did do some house hunting. And it was the most frustrating experience ever because there was like everybody was getting into bidding wars um, because, you know, we look pretty young for our age being like Asian. So whenever we walk into a house, like the real estate agent agent immediately gives you this look and is like, why are you here? Like, are you seriously, like you kids, you can't afford this house. Like stop wasting my time. Right. They don't even like, they don't even say hi to you. They're just like, are you sure you found the right place? Like, are you sure you can afford this? So at that point I started thinking, okay. I, and I think um, back then, like houses were on average, like at least 500,000. And I was I thinking, like yes, yeah, way more than that now. But back then I was thinking, wait a minute, I'm going to give you, I'm going to be in debt for the rest of my life and give you half a million dollars. And you're going to treat me like this. I was like, no way. And then it, it just kept like, it kept getting worse. Like we saw houses, we were renting in this neighborhood. And then we saw this house down the street from us that looked like, like seriously, it looked like a haunted house. Like there was, you know, there was like holes in the backyard, random holes that, <laughs> that the person had dug. There was like signs on the windows that said the UFOs need to keep out. There was like red paint all over it that you're like, is it blood? Is it paint? I don't know what it is. I don't want to touch it. Um, and then, uh, I was like, okay, this house is condemned and the city needs to like close it down. I, I, no one, like, I don't know what to do with this in, house in the neighborhood. And then like a week from when we saw that, the actually house like, was listed for sale. And I was like, what? Someone's going to actually try to buy this house. Come on, no way. Um, and then within, within like a week or two, it was actually sold. It sold like double for the uh, double the asking price. They sold for like 800,000 or something crazy like that. Uh, oh no, sorry. It sold for like 400,000 and then the person flipped it and then sold it for 800,000. Yeah. So it's like, it, it, it was like this, is, this is basically a giant scam. I was like, wow, it's a everyone's, Ponzi scam. <laughs> everyone's scamming each other on this. So at that point we were just like, okay, what else can we do? And then we started <laughs> reading about investing, reading about how to, how the stock market worked. And we found JL Collins who was on your uh, program before, uh, Mr. Money Mustache and those people. And then we kind of figured, oh, okay. If we we could either, and at that point we kept building up, we were uh, saving up a down payment fund, and we're like, okay, we could just we could hand this money over to a real estate agent and be, and then be in debt for the next twenty five years, or we could potentially, if we keep saving at the way that we're going and invested instead, we could potentially retire in three, and that's when the light bulb moment went on in our head, went off in our head, and we're just like, oh, that sounds much better. Wow. Yeah. So just three years later, you you figured you could you could get to the point where you could start working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we, yeah. we were. We were aggressively saving to, to um, buy the house. To buy the house because, <laughs> and what we kept finding is that we would we would save for like a hundred thousand dollars, but then the houses would get become a hundred thousand uh, dollars more the next year, and it just it just kind of felt like we were just chasing this uh, goalpost that kept moving, and it didn't seem that it didn't seem fair. Yeah, and it was really crazy. Is like my coworkers, um, they were so stressed out from paying their mortgages. One of them collapsed and almost died at his desk. And then there was massive layoffs at my work. And I'm like, why are people doing this? This doesn't make any sense. Like, do you want to die for a house? Is that really worth it? Yeah. Everybody you want to be buried in your house? Everybody in Canada is just uh, in debt up to like their eyeballs. Like the, uh, all anyone cares about is their house, house, house. And they're just working to pay off their mortgage. And then uh, so they can buy more house. It just seems like it's, a, it's, a, it's like a pointless existence. 
Um, and we and there's got to be we were just got like well, there's got to be another way. And but then when we found it, and then we we pulled out this retirement stuff, and then we started traveling. We're just kind of like, oh, this is way better. So and that's why we've been doing it, you know, ever since. Yeah, brilliant. I mean, and the message is really, really strong. I'm, I'm guessing in the audience there must be some people with their houses and maybe some big mortgages, like thinking about this because it's in Belgium we have the same. You know, it, it, the culture is similar, right? The key, to, the key to success is uh, study, get a job, get married, get the house. And the baby is sort of in between, you know, whenever you have time. Exactly. <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah, but like focus on what matters first, no? Um, but yeah, the house is a big thing. It comes with this aspect of security, right? Mm -hmm. um, which for a lot of people is like number one reason they, they have to ever think about finance. So how do you, like, where do you find security if you don't have a house? Like, you know, this is the main thing most people buy a house for. So how do you deal with that? Yeah. I actually think that, um, so there's, there's this idea that like, if you own something like you, that that's like your property, you can do whatever you want with it. And then, you know, it's yours for life. But the thing that people don't realize is that, uh, you don't actually own it. It's the bank that owns it. So, you know, like even after you pay off your mortgage, you still have to pay maintenance. You still have to pay insurance. You still have to pay property taxes. Like all those costs never, ever go away. And on top of that, things always break. Like it's not just buying the house. It's the ownership cost of the house. Um, so what, what we found that is really different after retirement, because people are like, oh, you like you're going to travel the world. You're going to spend so much money, like, like the 4% rule, $40,000. You're going to need double that to travel the world. There's no way you can live on that. Right. Um, but for us, what we found is that uh, after we retired and we are renting and traveling around the world because we can use something called geographic arbitrage, uh, which is like, you know, we're using like Canadian dollars or American dollars. And then we're spending it in places like Poland and places like um, like. Portugal and places like Thailand, the cost of living drops dramatically, right? And it gives you the flexibility of like picking the best place with the best weather. Like right now this year, we're stuck here in Toronto. We're like, oh my God, what is, what is this snow thing? Like how do why people have to deal with this? Like, I don't even know what I'm supposed to do. So, cause we've been, you know, just spending all the winters in, in really nice places like Portugal for a fraction of the price that it would cost to live in an expensive city. So uh, one of the things that you get when that when you don't have to buy a house is flexibility. Now I, I get that. Um, like if there are people who buy a house responsibly and if it's like, you know, they can actually afford it and it's part of their lifestyle, that's totally fine. Like I'm not against buying a house in total. It's, it get, it's like, I'm against irresponsibly buying a house and then trying to uh, basically like make money quickly by flipping the house. Right. So if people are buying that as like their family, they're there, that's part of their lifestyle. They don't want to travel the world and they're very responsible financially. That's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Right. It's just, I want to show that there's a different path. Like it's not just what society tells you. There's only one way to live. Um, you know, you've got to follow that life plan, the blueprint that they give you, right? Like after you graduate, you got to get married. And then after you get married, you have a kid. It, and then after that you buy a house and you know you show off your house to your friends and that's your entire life no it doesn't have to be like that like we've been living for the last five years um much better than we did in toronto spending less money and getting the best weather that we could possibly get um and i think with this pandemic what people have realized is that digital nomadicism so the idea that you could actually work online and then um like earn money online, but then live in a less expensive place because you don't need to be in the city that your job exists in. Therefore, you can bank a much bigger gap in terms of how much you make and how much you spend. That is a real thing. Like it's no longer fringes of the society. Like, oh, only you, if you have special jobs, you can do that. Like only weirdo people do that. Everybody else works in the same city. Everybody else has, that is now a, a real possibility. Like a lot of people who used to have jobs that, you know, they thought for sure they have to go into the office. Um, companies have had to adopt adapt to um, the pandemic. And then as a result, people are moving out to less expensive cities. They're reala realizing that their cost of living could be dropped and then they can work online. So that, that is the entire concept of digital nomadicism, that you don't have to be buying a house and staying one place for the rest of your life. Ironically here, they, they're getting the idea of digital nomadicism and the idea that you can move to a lower cost city, but they haven't quite flipped it in their head that that doesn't mean you have to buy anything. So like what's happening here with the, the real estate in and the downtown core is hollowing out because everyone's fleeing the diseased like you know cities and they're going out into the countryside but then they're buying um they're they're they're, they're then getting into bidding wars again like where there's uh, in remote areas where there's, way, where there's way less price so that's causing the prices to spike up and then and then also they're not getting the same benefit anymore the um the you, it's possible to be stable while being perpetual renters 
right? Because it's like, as long as you don't, ha- as long as you're not like, I must live in this neighborhood, um, mm. you, like, again, the world is a big, wide place, right? And all you guys have Belgian passports and everyone loves you guys all around the world. Um, you can be anywhere, right? And uh, when you have that insane flexibility, like you could be like, you could be like uh, living in like next to the beach in Vietnam and uh, dropping your cost by like half, which is what we did at some points uh, during our travels. And uh, yeah, it, it, you don't, you don't need to, um, you, not everybody has to eventually own a house. It's, but if you do that, that's great. Just make sure that that's, you're not going into that with the idea of I have to do this or I may as well kill myself, which is when bad things happen. Like people start overpaying because yeah. they, don't, they, they believe that there's no other option. Yeah, so the extreme is really dangerous. Um, but, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I love the idea that um, you, security can also be flexibility. And in the sense, like, yes, you can move around fast. You have, you have, uh, yeah, you can, you can change, you know, when things change around you, you just, you just adapt and you have that flexibility of moving, getting to a place that's higher, the low cost or better, better seasons or closer to people you want to be close to and sort of just move around with your needs. No. And there's something comforting with that too, not being stuck in a place where if you want to move, it's like, it's a whole one year process and whatever, all the costs and all the hassle of moving. Now there's, there's something also quite powerful there. Um, Christy, you talked about the, the, the normal blueprint to life, right? And then, and then we move very quickly into digital nomadism. All right. Uh, can you tell us about what is your blueprint to get to that, like to get to FI, to get to the position you're in today? What are, like, where does it start? Because we, we all know the normal blueprint, but what's, what's the alternative blueprint? I, I think that the number one thing to do is actually really reflect and think about what kind of life you want to live. Like, what are your values and what kind of life you want to live? Okay. It's not about like, I'm going to look at other people. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to copy them. Like, do you want to travel? Do you like, what is your perfect day in retirement? Like, do you want to spend more time with your kids? Do you want to work on some sort of passion project? Do you want to uh, maybe like go build houses for Habitat for Humanity? You want to give back to the world? Like whatever it is that is your dream, like that is what you need to be working towards, not what society tells you you need to be working towards. And then what financial independence does is it's a tool to help you have all the time in the world to do that thing that you want to do. So um, the number one step is to figure out what it is that you want and separate what you want from what other people want you to do. So like number one, figure out what you want. And then number two is um, in order to achieve that dream, the best way to do that is to have financial uh, freedom. And what that means is you are no longer tied to a job. You can choose to continue working, but the fact that your um, portfolio is generating enough passive income to cover your expenses gives you the time to live that dream, to whatever that dream life happens to be. And then number three is in order to achieve financial independence, you have to learn how to invest. You have to figure out what your savings rate is. You have to optimize your expenses and you have to learn how to invest to build that portfolio. And then number four is do what, like do it. actually make that dream come true. That's, uh, yeah, that's obviously the, the path that we followed as well. Obviously after reading your blog and Jill Collins's and, and, and Mr. Money Mustache, um, something that we, we encounter a lot in the community is people who say, yes, I mean, this, this is interesting and I, I love the idea. It's just that when I do the math, like FI for me is 20 years away. Um, like what, what, how do you, like, what do you say to people who, you know, they, they've, they've optimized what they could and they're still a, a long time ahead. And so their passion or their dream, which might be different from what they do for work is far away. Like how do you suggest people handle that? Or what's your, what's your advice in those cases? Yeah. So I think in that case, um, it's not so much the end result that everybody keeps focusing on. It's the journey that, that you would want to focus on the process. Right. So even if you don't like want to be fully FI and like quit your job and travel the world, maybe you want to um, do something in your job. You become partially FI. Like the portfolio is enough to cover part of your expenses, but not the entire amount. Can you step down, like step down to like a part-time job from your work or maybe go from a high paying job to like, or medium paying job to a lower paying job so that you don't have as much stress so that you have some of the time freed up to do what you want. Right. So it doesn't always have to be very black and white. It's like, I'm either like FI or I'm a failure and I'm not, if I don't get to FI, then I might as well give up. No, it's, it's about 
the process. Like you have to enjoy the process and not be killing yourself to get to FI because that's also not the message to take away from this as well. So I, I would recommend for the people who are like looking at that number, it's like, oh my God, 20 years, like I can't imagine doing this job for 20 years. And like, what's the point of this goal? I'm never going to get there. You're staring at Mount Everest and you're trying to climb Mount Everest. Don't climb it. <laughs> Figure out like, what is it that you can do in your life to make yourself happier? with maybe switching jobs, maybe bringing the hours down, and then even partial FI, like just having that financial security um, will make a big difference. Like even people who have, like they don't even have a portfolio, they just have an emergency fund. Like that gives you a lot of peace of mind, especially given what's happening with the pandemic. Anything can happen at any point, you don't know, but having that just even some money set aside, it, 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 you're actually like better off than, like I think the American st statistic is like 75% Americans have less than a thousand dollars in emergency funds. So just looking at that statistic, you could be better than 70% of the people in the states. Like just having that that you know mind that's the the um, the fact that you have some money set aside, you're already like so much better off than other people. So please don't look at the end goal and just like beat yourself up and saying like this is not possible. It, it will like you can always make a difference in your life. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. And there's always the, um, like a lot of people make a, make the mistake of drastically overestimating how expensive that their dreams are. Like if you kind of think, oh, I want to travel the world and uh, like, like us or something like that. And then, uh, and then, but then they run the numbers and it's like ridiculously expensive. But, um, and, but if you kind of like, but if you dig into it and like what people do is they kind of assume that what they are living on now is what they oh, yeah. will need to retire because they, you know, that's the one that they have the most data on, right? And, and then they, they kind of go, oh, I want a vacation and vacation packages cost oh, yeah. like, you know, this, you know, 10, 10,000 euros, 20,000 euros, so I have to add that onto it. It's like the, the lifestyle is actually a lot cheaper. Like our lifestyle is a lot cheaper. It, like it, it surprises people when, um, uh, when we tell, tell people that we live and travel around the world continuously for $40,000. Because remember when we, we're Canadian, so that's 40,000 Canadian dollars, it's like 30, which is US about 30,000 US dollars, which would be like 25,000 euros or maybe like, like, 20, 20 or 18,000 pounds, right? So it's like all of a sudden when, when I say that, when I, when I bring those numbers out to like people in the UK, they're like, you're living on how much? And you're doing <laughs> The reason why we're doing that is because we're not, main, like most of the time when you're traveling, you're maintaining a home back in your home country, right? You're paying rent or you're, pay, you're still paying the mortgage. And then on top of that, you're paying for hotels. We don't do any of that stuff. There is no home base. Once we leave this Airbnb, that's it. Like there, there is, like we're only paying for exactly what we're living in. And so it's basically just like paying rent, but it's just that you're paying a different rent in each, like you're, you're paying the same rent ish, like in different locations and in different cities around the world. So, uh, so it, that's why it's important to kind of envision what, like what it is that you want to do, because um, it, you, you might, you might find out it's a lot cheaper than, than you think. Oh, like we know people that do like a camper van style, like retirement mm -hmm. where they buy a camper van and take the kids and they go, they go camp out in like Australia and they drive around and that kind of stuff. And that lifestyle is a lot cheaper than you think because you can buy the camper van used and then sell it again used um, like afterwards, unless you, you know, crash it or something like that. So it's like, it's important to, it's important to figure out like what it is that your, your lifestyle wants to be in retirement and then go find people who are living it like that in order to get their kind of a more realistic budget of like, what did they spend? Cause it's probably going to, we were surprised by how little this lifestyle costs us. Yeah, I think another thing people don't realize until after you re retired is that you are paying to work. There's actually a lot of costs associating to, associated to having a job. For example, like you need to commute to work, you need to have nicer clo like work clothing. Um, you don't have time to make food for yourself, so you're constantly going out to eat. Um, there's decompression costs. Oh, I'm so stressed. I need to pay for a massage because I have really bad back pain. Now to pay for physio because now I have like other types of pain from sitting and typing in front of the computer or like whatever job you happen to do. Um, so one of the things that people don't realize is that you actually spend less money after you're retired because you don't have to have any of those costs. Um, and the thing that was really crazy that we discovered is that, okay, now that we're back in Toronto and we can't use geographic arbitrage, it's, it's a pandemic, we can't just fly to like Mexico or Thailand to reduce our costs, is that going to cause our costs to skyrocket? Because now we're in, in Toronto, it's five years later, inflation um, has happened in the last five years. And what we found this year is that we're gonna spend 36,000 living in Toronto, right? Because wow. one and of the in, things- Any MBABs, right? Airbnb is not even- 
Like, yeah. Right. The, the thing is like, what ends up happening is number, number one, like without having to work, you don't have to commute. So there's no commuting costs. And uh, we can cook our own food all the time and restaurants are closed anyway. So you have no choice to, but to get a takeout. There's nowhere to go because there's no sporting events. There's no movies, nothing. So then you end up like it's, you end up spending so much less money than you thought anyway. Right. So it's, it's not always just, I think this is what my expenses are and they're going to be like that forever. There, there's a lot of costs that people spend in order to work that they don't realize until after they leave. Uh, what you said initially about how flexibility is its own stability, like that really, really came into play this year because mm -hmm. we like, um, like on the surface, it seems like our flexibility got completely taken away from us. We had to fly back to Canada and we had to stay in one place. Right. But because we were continuously moving around, we could end up like finding deals where we didn't think that we could. So what I referenced this, this earlier where the, the downtown core kind of hollowed out as everyone fled from, the, fled from the center out into the suburbs. We were planning on living out in like surrounding uh, cities to, uh, to um, reduce our costs. That was our original plan. Um, but then like everyone got the same idea and they fled. But then all of a sudden it left all these condos in the middle of the city that were empty. And the people that own those things started getting desperate. And then they started dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping their rents. And uh, because we were just going month to month, every month we would switch and then find <laughs> a landlord and find a desperate landlord. Our, our rents are actually going down over time. <laughs> landlords are getting more desperate and they're losing money and they're just happy to take anybody that's willing to live in those cities. So it's like whenever everyone's fleeing this way, if you go the other way, that's where the value is. And, and, that, and that ended up becoming like, um, yeah, like, like what she was saying is like our cost of living actually went down this year, despite the fact that we were stuck in one place that that surprised even me. But yeah, flexibility really is the only thing that you can um, that is worth anything uh, in this unstable world of ours. I mean, uh, if you buy a place and, you, and you're stuck there for 25 years, you don't know what's going to happen the next day. You don't know whether it's going to be a pandemic. There's all these people that are like, you know, there was uh, there's also, um, uh, you know, the U.S. recently had their election. And one of the things that surprised people was there was so many states like Arizona that went blue and then people are like, well, what, what the hell, yeah, what, never happened, what happened there? Yeah. And they, they went, they, they dug into it and they kind of realized that um, people in California were like, you know, they were buying all these expensive properties that, and going into deep mortgages. And then their houses were like burning down because every year there's a forest fire and there's a forest, there's a really big one this year. Right. So they kind of went, Oh, they, they started losing money and they kind of went, oh, screw this. And then they started moving into the neighboring states like Texas, like Arizona, like all these places. And then those states started flipping from red <laughs> to blue, right? So like buying a place does not actually give you as much stability as you think it is. In, in fact, if anything, it actually makes it worse. That's a very interesting perspective because it goes against so much of what we've been told, no? And I what know, we've learned. And, uh, yeah. but, but, but the example you gave there is like the... Flexibility being the ultimate level of security is um, like you give a beautiful example, and and I, you can apply that to this to, to you can apply this to almost everything. No, I mean, yeah, because it, it's a power. No, you go where there's opportunity and where people are trying to move out of, and and you take advantage of the fact that everyone else is stuck, and you guys are flexible, and that's yeah. I think that's the, that, that's the new rule to life because it used to be this, this blueprint I was talking about. That's actually based on very old rules, right? The fact that you have stability if you buy a house. Um, that was actually true when you had a job that you could, you know, you have a job for 25 years, then you get a pension. As long as you are very loyal to the company, the company will take care of you. That used to be true, but now it's like I, I, all, a lot of my friends, they're switching jobs every five years, not because they want to, but because they're getting laid off. So it's, it's not the same as before. Like companies have changed the way that um, they're, they're treating their employees have changed. Um, so many things have changed since that old rule book was created. That's like, this is going to give you stability. Yeah. If you can invent a time machine and then go back 20 years where houses were actually affordable and you could have a job for 25 years and actually get a pension, then yes, that, that rule was true, yeah. but it's no longer true because the world has changed. Oh, is it just me or do, or do you keep hearing the term once in a generation blah? Because they, they keep saying, oh, this is a once in a oh, yeah. generation. This is a once in a generation pandemic, and then 2008 was a once in a generation financial great crisis. financial crisis, yeah. and then 2001 was a once in a generation Ex terrorist attack, and then yeah. 2000 was a once in a generation like, te technology te te crash. Uh, crash. Yeah. And it yeah. was kind of like, how is it that I've seen four once in a generation events in, in my one lifetime? generation? That doesn't make any sense. Someone's like, there is no stability anymore. So the only thing that makes any so the, the, the only thing that makes any sense is like for us, it's like all of our belongings can fit into two backpacks. So when this shit hits a fan, we're out of here in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's another, it's the new form of security, no? 
Yes. <laughs> it's like the new world. You need new rules and new security and flexibility. It might be that. It, it reminds me of a, a different topic that you uh, that you cover quite a lot in your book, guys. Everyone, if you haven't read the book, Aww. this is a must. I love it. Um, and like this some really good stuff in there which some of it we're going to talk about today some that i want people to go and get uh, and, and read on their own but you, you talk about resilience in the book and i love it how you bring it because you talk about resilience as part of an acronym that says crap <laughs> <laughs> can you tell us more about that because i think it fits nicely with flexibility in the end you need resilience and you need all of the stuff that goes with this crap <laughs> yeah, so, so basically the, the whole idea of resistance came about because um, I uh, grew up poor because I was actually born in, in China and we immigrated uh, to Canada when I was eight years old. So a lot of the life experience, like you get, like when you're young, that's where a lot of your life experience forms, right? So I think very differently from a lot of the other North American friends that I have because uh, growing up in China, like at one point my family was living on like 44 cents a day, right? So so like the, the idea that... Um, you like the government's going to take care of you and you buy a house, everything is going to be okay. It's not true in China. There's like no safety net, right? So you really have, there's a lot of relying on yourself, right? So um, the, the fact that I came up with that acro crap ac acronym is like uh, the fact that you have to have resilience and creativity and adaptability and uh, perseverance is because um, you don't choose these things. Like when you grow up poor, you have no choice. You're like, this sucks. Well, you know what? That's just your life. You did not get to choose to be poor, but you are poor. So what are you going to do about it now? Right. Um, so like when I, when it came time for me to choose, uh, my career, I wanted to be a writer, but my dad's like, I'm sorry, honey, but that, that is a joke. Like I am not, I'm not rich. So if you, it, if you don't make it as a writer, you can't come and live my house in my house and I can't support you. You have to, you're going to be out on the street and you have to support yourself because I have to support us and all these people, your relatives living in China, they all need money. I have to send the money every, every month back home. You can't be selfish and pick something that you enjoy. Right. So, uh, so I actually made the decision to become an engineer with math rather than with like passion. So it, it came from that whole, like, the, the ability to be resilient and push through this career um, because you, like it's the idea that bad things happen but you can you can choose to like your choices are something that you will always have and if you choose logically then you're actually going to have a much better um, outcome than if you choose things emotionally so um, even though all these like people are like oh my god I like, like your childhood sounds terrible all these things but I'm like I'm actually really glad that that happened to me because if none of that things those things happened to me there's 100% chance I would not be financially independent right now because I like I wouldn't have developed any resilience I wouldn't have had to push myself through engineering I wouldn't have been driven to save money I would just be thinking oh you know what I, I like something I'm just gonna buy it and if I get into debt whatever and if anything goes wrong whatever somebody will just come save me it's it's really developing that mindset that bad things will happen but you you can always choose how to react to it and I choose to think of my poverty growing up as a good thing rather than a bad thing because if it wasn't for that I wouldn't be this person that I am now yeah I think I mean obviously your story is something that shapes your book and yeah your message very very strongly and it's very unique in the world of FI no I mean I haven't I don't think I've come across some someone who's experienced so many different levels of, of life in the sense or of wealth and of, of everything no you've you've been through so much obviously it builds resilience because you had to handle all of that and builds obviously flexibility and like you guys are living the perfect example of how you can use that power um but yeah so your book really really goes uh quite well into into those details and uh, so obviously going through all of these life experiences and very strong and some of them very 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 tough like you don't regret it and it obviously built you into who you are and i think it, it shaped a lot of what you have done the two of you as a couple right um it was tough right and so uh, my question is for, for people who like i wish other people had resilience like you guys have but like it means they have to go through something hard. Is there, is there some, like, can we wish to people that they go through stuff that's really hard so that they come back on top and bigger and better, stronger after it? Like how do, you know, it's like this, like what, what doesn't break you makes you stronger, but it's still really, really hard on the way. Like, <laughs> is this something you wish to others? Cause it's obviously for you guys, it's a superpower. Uh, we're all going through something hard right now. We're going through this pandemic. Yeah. Right? yeah. 
this is this is really showing people what they what like how like what happens when uh, like how they react to bad things happening. Do they complain and then whine that the government's not doing more for them? Do they start yelling about having to wear a mask? Like, do uh, they start yelling at Chinese people for bringing the virus? Like, what is the reaction? <laughs> is, there, is there reaction race yeah. to, like racism? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just like 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 uh, people are really showing kind of. Um, who they are and how they deal with things when shit hits the fan. Because this is a unique situation in which everybody's in the same boat right now, where everybody's in trouble. And, um, and you can, you know, I, and, I, and I see, like, I, I talked to a lot of the guys that, you know, like you, like, um, and, and other people that we met with through talk, should talk was, and those people seem to react to things in a very different way. Like oh, yeah. they, they start, they, they start getting creative. They start helping people. They start do, like doing what you're doing and this kind of stuff. Uh, so this is so like the fact that you're doing this in the pandemic that rather than wallowing, you're trying to teach your fellow Belgians how this whole fire thing works this year. That shows who you are. That shows the kind of resilience that you have, right? That your, your instinct is to go help people. And um, whereas in America, the, their, their instinct seems to be to burn masks and shoot people. Right. So it's like, it's, you know, <laughs> It's a, certain parts of it. Are yeah, not parts. everyone. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, what we see in the Life news the doesn't help them. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess this is this is a massive challenge, and hopefully, people come, you know, come out of it stronger and better, and hopefully, more people will know about FI thanks to this. Because what else do you have to do on Tuesday and Wednesday night than to just you know, plug in and listen <laughs> to, yes. to, a, to a bunch of geeks talking about how life is good. <laughs> it's showing how important FI is because like, like I said before, this once in a generation thing, yeah. 10 years yeah. or 10, like 10 years from now, something is going to hit us again. Like the, the next recession is coming, right? And you better start preparing for that one now because if you got caught with, like the, the world by and large got caught with their pants down and completely unprepared for something like this, mm -hmm. right? The only people that seem to be able to, um, the only people that seemed to be able to handle this without really uh, breaking a sweat are the people that were REFI because they didn't need their jobs anymore. So they just they just sat there and watched their, uh, and they sat there and watched their money grow. Um, yeah. Because the first thing, the first thing the Americans rescued was the stock market for whatever reason, and um, so those people are doing just fine. And um, so and. If we can, once we get out of, once people we, uh, dig themselves out of the hole that, that this one caused, because if they were unprepared, they learned really quickly how depending on your job is not a good strategy because you, you know, you have no idea when, it doesn't matter how nice your boss is, it doesn't matter how well you're doing this year, you have no idea when that job's going to evaporate. So it's like, you know, get working on now to divorce yourself from the need to have a job because the next one's coming and you better be in a better, hopefully you're going to be in a, the people on this call will be in a better position to whether that next time it comes around. I also want to say that this pandemic is also proving that investing is very important for people to learn, right? For the people who actually stayed in the market and didn't try to like dance in and out of it or buy tech stocks or try to, you know, put money towards like vaccine stocks or something like that. Or Bitcoin, they, yeah. or Bitcoin right? The people who actually just you know, did what the financial independence um, community told them to do, which is stay in the market, don't do anything crazy. And then they get returns of like seven to 10% in a down in a pandemic, whereas other people who are dancing in out of the, the market ends up losing money like crazy. Like I know friends who decided to uh, do like put options and one of them lost like tens and thousands of, do of dollars because you cannot predict the future. Right. And then there's people who just sold in March because they were freaking out and saying, oh my God, it's going to go to zero. I'm going to sell everything now. And then now you just missed the recovery. So, and nobody can time it. Nobody can say, okay, I'm going to know exactly when the vaccines are going to come out. And I'm going to like get, you know, right out of the market at that time. And like, I'm going to get like into the market exactly in March. Like who could have predicted that exactly this is the timing, right? You know that you're going to have a vaccine. You just don't know when. Yeah. <laughs> It was literally like before this call, I was just checking out our portfolio and this kind of stuff. And she, and I was just like, we're up 7%. <laughs> in, a, in, in like, but everything shut down, right? It's just like, you really can't predict these things. And, and I, I certainly didn't predict, like I'm no stock picking genius. I certainly did not predict anything of this, mag, of this magnitude at the beginning of the year. I, I was convinced that maybe there'll be some choppiness around the election. Maybe Trump's gets impeached, but nothing like this, right? So, but the principles of the fire movement are, you buy index, uh, you don't try to make any bets on individual stocks. You don't try to outguess the future because you're going to be wrong. You put money into vehicles when you can, whenever you can, and you just hold it. You, know, you don't try to dance in and out of the market. And that strategy has proven um, like, like just to be able to weather this situation just perfectly. And I, no one was more flabbergasted than I was. And I was like, how are we up 7%? Okay, uh, that's good, right? 
So I think you just summarized your investment philosophy there, right? That's the question I wanted to ask you because it's a very important aspect of this conversation. Um, Christy, is that is that the way you would have framed it too? I mean, I'm pretty sure yes, but like, can, can you guys repeat? Because I think this is so important. Can, can you just explain again what's like the investment philosophy? Um, like for someone who doesn't know and doesn't understand, say, index funds, right? Like, right. So, in, so index funds are, um, are based on the idea that instead of betting on individual stocks or even individual sectors, you simply just buy everything. You buy the entire market. And you just and you do it in a way that's globally diversified, right? Because you don't know whether, um, like, you don't know which country's stock market is going to outperform at various points, and you just um, and you just hold it, right? And the the reason why you do that is because it means that you're not betting on any individual outcome. Like, I, people that were trying to bet which oh which company is going to uh, do uh, build the vaccine first or release the vaccine first, like they. If they get it wrong, it's gonna, they're going to lose money, right? But if you bet on all of the vaccine companies, one of them is going to get it right. Like, for example, is, a, is an example of that. So the, the, um, the, the strength of the stock market is happening because now that the vaccines are coming out, people are piling money back into stocks and they're doing it kind of like evenly across all companies. And, um, they're, they're, um, and that's, so you're benefiting from the entire world recovering from the pandemic, but rather than buying individual stocks and trying to figure out which one's going to go bust. And it's really important, especially for like uh, Americans have this tendency of, and it's not just Americans, uh, everyone tends to invest in their own country, uh, the stock market of their own country only. It's really important for countries that are smaller, like in Canada or Belgium, to uh, to get out of your own country and in instead invest in the world because, you know, like, if you like, if you were only to buy Canadian stocks, it would be like a bunch of finance companies and uh, and and some oil pipelines. If you were to buy only Belgian stocks, you guys would get I don't know a chocolate company. I don't know what you guys have, but like you want you want the entire world. You want Europe. You want Asia. You want the U.S. You want you know like so you want to buy everything in depending on like uh, and there's funds that we uh, recommend on our site and there's equivalent European funds. I believe they're called USITs. They're based in Ireland, but they're run by Vanguard and iShares, the same companies that we use. And that you guys can uh, that you guys can invest in. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. So let's let's dive a bit more into that. Um, so when you said that you were looking into um, in what else to do with your money, because at some point you had this money that you had decided not to look at real estate or maybe not to buy that those expensive houses, did you did you look at other ways of investing? And like, how did you come to the conclusion this was the way to go? Well, um, when it, so uh, we knew we didn't want to go into debt for a primary residence. And when I say uh, real estate bad, not all real estate. Um, if, uh, if, the, if the house is you're buying something for you to live in and it's a reasonable cost and you can pay the mortgage down uh, like in a few years, that's fine. There's also um, real estate investing, which is a very different animal from buying primary residence. That's buying apartment buildings and then renting them out. So we looked into that a little bit and then we realized we really don't want to be landlords. I know there's people like... Um, for example, Mr. Money Mustache, he made his money with real estate and, and that, by that he was, he was buying houses and then like fixing them up and then, and then selling them. That is not me. This is not the body of somebody who likes to swing a hammer, right? This is, <laughs> this is, this is the body of somebody that likes sitting on, on the couch and watching Netflix. Uh, <laughs> a financial blogger body, not a, uh, you know, construction body. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've come to, I've come to terms with that. But anyway, uh, so it's like, so that's one option. Um, but uh, index investing or stock investing um, is the most passive one in that it requires in that it's the most accessible. It doesn't require any individual uh, skills or preternatural abilities or even much of an education to do. Anybody that can open up a brokerage account can do it. They just need to know like how to do it safely. It's uh, it has the lowest barrier of entry and it is also the most international. So like uh, we knew that we wanted to travel, um, but we didn't know that we were going to travel this much. But, but like owning an apartment building it's very difficult to travel to Southeast Asia to escape the winter. If you're worried about your tenants cooking meth back in your apartment <laughs> back home. So it's like, you know, so we realized that that wasn't our thing. Like, and, and also the, uh, the speculative investments, like trying to out time the market, we just didn't have the time or the energy or the expertise to sit around and read company press releases to, yeah. to do that. Index investing is the one that's the easiest and most accessible to everybody. And it's also the one that has the most reproducibly good results. 
Yeah, it's the most mathematically reproducible. So because we're engineers, we like things that are mathematically reproducible, not just because somebody just randomly, like some financial advisor is like, invest in this hedge fund and it'll make you 18%. And you're like, how does it make me 18%? Show me the actual data. And they're like, no, it's proprietary. I can't tell you anything, right? That's not reproducible. So if it's not reproducible, I'm not going to go down that route. Um, I also thought, found that it suited um, our personality, especially since I came from a, like a poverty background where I'm very risk adverse. So like I want to invest safely, not just throw money into Bitcoin and then hopefully something will pay out, right? So it, it, it suited our personality because of the lower risk and it also um, is mathematically reproducible. And how does it compare with people who are trading stocks or investing in specific sectors and things like that? What, what do you say to those people? And obviously they have their own arguments, but... Uh... Individual stock picking, there's actually many different ways um, to buy individual stocks. So uh, like, and you have to kind of know yourself to kind of figure out what strategy that you want to follow. So one example is uh, value investing. So a value investing is, uh, is basically, I think this stock that's really, really uh, like low right now and because uh, everyone hates it. I think that there's, I don't, I don't think it's going to, go, going to go out of business. So I'm going to bet on it and then try to, and hope that it turns around. So that's one way of uh, that's one way of investing. It's called value investing. Growth investing is um, is I think this company is going to come up with the vaccine first, and then it's going to go up. So you're betting on future, you know, a, a future outcome. Another one is momentum investing, which is I'm going to use all these charts and look at it and see like, oh, here's a here's this here's this rising channel pattern, and therefore I'm going to do each of these um, each of these um, things are very very active. Um, strategies that people go to school for they have computer they have analysts like like this i'm not saying that those don't work but the people that are able to do that successfully are like they have they're like you it requires some ability it requires some skill and so a lot of these guys go and do it all like you're, you're basically competing against people who are like day trading warren buffett for example is a very famous value investor because he's he has a very good eye for companies that are beaten down and he thinks he can go in there and like fix something or change the leadership and turn it around. So that's kind of what he does. Um, so you have to kind of understand that those kinds of buying individual stocks requires a great deal of more effort, some skill and a lot of luck. Index investing requires none of those. It's the most passive one. Yeah. It requires no skill, no luck. You just, you just do it. Right. So, you know, I'm not saying that those strategies don't work, but I don't know how to do it. <laughs> And so how, how long, how long does it take you guys to manage your, your investments? Uh, like how, we actually, um, yeah, how much work, not, like how much work does it take? Not just the fun part. <laughs> I think the probably most time consuming part is the tax optimization part, the actual like rebalancing and then like buying the actual ETF. That's very simple. And for anyone who wants to do like a step to step breakdown of exactly what we do to build our portfolio and how we um, rebalance it, uh, we have a free workshop on our uh, blog. So you can, I'll, like you probably know the link and can link to it in the show notes. Uh, but basically it's really straightforward to actually buy and rebalance. Um, but I think overall we just do like financial meetings. Like we just kind of like talk it over every quarter um, throughout the year. And it doesn't really require that much more time than that. It's yeah. not as complicated. Like people think it's really complicated. Okay. So the thing is the financial industry wants you to think that investing is really complicated because then now you can go pay an advisor 2% of everything you make, regardless of whether the stock market is going up or down because it's so complicated and they have to do it for you. Uh, but it's not, it's not complicated. Like we've talked to people who are uh, in Thailand and they didn't know anything about investing and they, they read the book, they, they tried the workshop and now they're actually investing their first $10,000 and they're artists. They're like, I'm not good at math. I don't understand any of the math stuff, but I understand of it. I'd understand this because of you. It's, so it's not complicated. You don't need to be an engineer. You don't need to have a PhD. Don't listen to all those financial advisors that are telling you it's really hard because they, would, they just want you to pay them to do it. Also on the workshop, we created tools like spreadsheets that help that do all the math for you because we, we found ourselves, people kept asking us how to do the math, how to do the math. So we just made some tools that help people. In terms of how much time that we actually spend making changes, it's maybe like half an hour once a year on like right after New Year's, that kind of thing. That's when I that's when I do all the stuff. We look at it a lot because we're, like, <laughs> uh, but that's not actual. Especially in good actual, times. Yeah, those yeah. are fun. Uh, but we, don't, we don't actually do any work on it until like basically once a year. Yeah, and uh, I mean in Belgium, there's a lot less tax optimization. Tax optimization that's possible when it comes to rebalancing and withdrawing. Um, so it's, a lot. No it's even simpler. You have, you have no, no capital, capital gains tax. tax. No yeah. capital gains. Yeah, simplifies so much of it for you. One of the best countries to invest from. 
Oh yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Totally. Like if you're it, like, uh, we had a, we had a Chautauqua guest that was from like Denmark and she was telling me like the horror stories of how many, like of all the burdensome like taxes that, that the Danish government puts on the thing. Like if you invest outside of Denmark, they start, they just basically take a percentage of it no matter what, like even if it's gone down and this kind of stuff. So they, it's, it's like a punitive, like sovereign, like, or foreign investment tax. So, so she basically like, I have to invest in only Danish companies, which is Maersk and a chocolate company. Like, I'm, 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 <laughs> only Maersk. All, all of Danish culture is just Maersk. Yeah, and and whatever company makes all those pastries, like that's that's basically the, there's only they only have three companies. Okay, so uh, so it's much more difficult for her to do that. And then I told her, and then and then she was like, "So how do I do this?" And I told her, "Move to Belgium." <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Why don't you guys move over here and just just get an address here? Yeah, we, yeah, because EU won't let us in. I know you guys. We're on your blacklist. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. Oh no! Canadians allowed. Oh jeez. Okay. Sad. Well, Otherwise, wait. I would be in Europe for like right away. Seriously, I would be on the next plane to Belgium if we are allowed to come to your country. We were actually, we actually were planning on going to Portugal <laughs> yeah. in January after this. Yeah. And then, and then everything like went, yeah, and then no, everything we're not shut allowed down. to go anymore. When all of this is over, we'll, we'll plan a real big Saturday. meetup with everyone from Belgium. It doesn't have to be in Belgium, but you know, we'll make sure there's chocolate and beer. Yeah. Oh, yes, please. <laughs> um, so let's, let's dive a bit more into investing. Um, Christy, you said that you were a very risk averse investor, mm-hmm. but then you also said that you invest in the stock market. Like, how do you, like, how does that even fit together? For most people, this is like the most opposite thing you could say in the same sentence. Okay, so from someone who is really risk adverse, your biggest, uh, the, the thing that terrifies you, your biggest nightmare is putting the money in and it goes to zero, right? Like companies go bankrupt, you buy individual stocks and your entire portfolio goes to zero. That is the biggest fear for risk, invest, uh, risk adverse investors. Um, so that is why index funds gives me a lot of comfort because it's not just one company. Like if you're investing in the S&P 500, it's the biggest 500, fi- the 500 biggest companies. So if one of them goes bankrupt, it just gets replaced with another one, right? So that there's no chance of every single one of those companies going bankrupt. Um, so I think it's getting over that uh, hump is really understanding the metrics behind it and understanding how it works and how it's very transparent to be um like, because it's easier to understand than esoteric investments like hedge funds in which they don't explain what they buy in the portfolio. They don't explain what your allocation is, like what percentage is going towards each um, company. And is it some sort of Ponzi scheme? Like I have to be able to transparently see exactly what's within that. Like, what am I, what are my holdings in that ETF? How has it done uh, historically? So like, it gives me, I think the biggest thing is your, your portfolio can't go to zero with index funds. It's very transparent and there's lots of tools online. One of the things we use a portfolio analyzer and it actually helps you analyze like throughout history like how well um, that ETF has do- uh, has done and you can actually put the exact um, allocation of like what each e- how many um, percentage you're going to- towards each ETF and how many bonds you have in your portfolio so it's a very transparent look at everything and I've given that tool to multiple people um, or readers that write in that are like you know my, my financial advisor keeps saying that my portfolio is doing well and I'm paying him two percent and it's always lagging your portfolio like why is that and then when they actually like show when they actually do the portfolio analyzer they realize that a lot of the uh, hedge funds and whatever crap that their um, financial advisor is putting them in is actually performing horribly and then charging them two percent for the benefit of doing worse than the s p 500 so it's very important for the process to be transparent and for it to um like to not lose everything those are the two most important things when it comes to investing going back that uh, lose everything um thing uh, uh problem um, it's very important that whatever index that you uh, invest in, it's their methodology is what's called a market cap weighted index. So basically what that means is that um, it doesn't own, like, for example, the S&P 500 doesn't own an equal amount of 500 companies. If, if the company has more, um, if the company has a, a higher value, it owns more of it. And if it has a lower, like if the company is worth less, it owns less of it. So it, it, it weights how much it owns of each company by their market cap, which is their total company value. So this has the effect of if a company, let's say Elon Musk gets COVID. I actually think Elon Musk did get COVID. Actually. He did get COVID. He did get COVID. <laughs> okay, that's okay. Bad example, bad example. <laughs> let's say like- um, Let's say Amazon, something happens, bad happens to Amazon. And it starts going down and down and down and down in value. As that happens, the index fund will automatically sell off more and more of it until eventually, when, uh, until eventually, when it drops off of the index because its value is so low, it doesn't own any of it at all. So this effect, um, this effect prevents an index fund from holding on to 
uh, a company all the way down to the ground floor. It actually, it will automatically drop it when it starts to, when it's basically not big enough. So that mechanism is what gives you the inherent safety of an index fund. Uh, so the Dow Jones Industrial Average, for example, is an is a index that doesn't do this. It's called a price weighted index. So you don't want to invest in, uh, in, in something like that because um, you, you actually want a market weighted index. So the S&P 500 is a good example of that. The um, uh, the MSCI EFI index, which uh, ha which covers Europe, Australia, and Far East, that's a, that's a, that's a good example. And Vanguard, uh, basically anything from Vanguard, except uh, except some one, something that tracks the Dow Jones, um, will have this effect that automatically protects you from basically a company going bankrupt, dragging your entire portfolio down. You also mentioned bonds at some point. What yes. what, what what role does what role do bonds play in a portfolio? Sure. So. Uh, B bonds have the effect of um, kind of evening out your portfolio. So when, so if you were to, you know, read the Wall Street Journal or, you know, these business shows and, and when they say that money is like risk off, um, in scary times, money flows from equities into bonds because bonds are seen as safe because they're backed by the government. Um, and it's just like, th there's no risk of that going bankrupt generally. Um, so the more, so, as a result of this, bonds and equities tend to move in opposite directions. So if you hold both bonds and equities, um, it will have this effect of reducing the volatility of your portfolio. So you generally want to have a majority of your portfolio in equities because that is where your growth is going to come from. But depending on how close you are to retirement, you want more bonds. So for example, for somebody who is pre, you know, just starting off on their fire journey, they just got the first job or, and they're starting to, you know, invest and save money in this kind of stuff. It makes sense to have a very, very uh, high equity exposure. So like 90, 10, or even 80% equities, 20% fixed income. As they get closer and closer to retirement, you want to actually even out uh, your, your equity holdings. So when, at the moment that we retired, we were at 60 equity and 40% bonds because when you are actually living off of that money, you don't want it to be swinging up and down so wildly with the stock market. You want it to be more, more even, even keel. Um, so yeah, so uh, the percentage of your portfolio to hold in equity and the percentage to hold in fixed income is a science slash art called asset allocation, which we cover on our blog in greater detail. But basically the rules are the further you are from retirement, the more equities that you, uh, that you want, the closer you are to retirement, the more bonds you want. Yeah. And how does it work um, after you've hit FI? Is, does the rule still apply? Do you stay at 60, 40? What happens next? Uh, it's actually a little bit different from uh, for for fire people because traditional in retirement planning suggests that once you hit retirement, you keep going up and up and up in bond, uh, up in bonds until base uh, until um, because you want more and more stability because you're spending it off of it and then you die like uh, like thirty years later when you're when you're <laughs> yeah. Uh, because, but it's called die broke uh, strategy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. that's don't that's, recommend that's it. traditional <laughs> planning. Um, Early retirees, because our runway is so much longer than that, like we're not looking at 20 or 30 year retirements, we're looking at 60 year retirements, if we're lucky. Um, so uh, what actually makes more sense there is that you, when you start off, uh, when you start off, you, you're, you're heavily into equities. And as you go back into retirement, you kind of even out to like, you know, 60, 40 is kind of where we draw the line of how low we want to go. And then over time, you actually, uh, as your portfolio gains in value and, um, and you don't need as much of the yield as a percentage. You actually you actually start going back the other direction and 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 having portfolio and having more equities going forward. The reason for this is that equities also bonds pay interest, uh, but equities also pay a dividend. And when you are um, when your portfolio value goes uh, up to you know let's say so for our numbers it was a million dollars for the portfolio value and our living expenses was. $40,000. So we needed 4%. We need to draw 4%. Over time, as your portfolio value goes up and you, for example, like, you know, let's say five or uh, five or 10 years down the road, maybe it's sitting at 1.3, 1.4 million. And you're still living off of like, you know, $40,000, which is kind of what we're doing. Uh, as a percentage, you don't need as much of your portfolio to be, to be drawing down. And so at that point, you can get rid of some of the more fixed income stuff and then put more into equity because you can live off of a lower equity, the dividend yield of, of equities. That actually will encourage you to increase your equity exposure as you go further and further into retirement, which also gives you more capital gains in the long term because that's what helps with inflation and that kind of stuff. So it's, so it's kind of like a seesaw. For, for fire people, it's actually kind of a seesaw effect where you start like this, then retire, and then come back the other direction. 
traditional retirement is you start off like this and then you just kind of go like this, 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 this until you're hundred percent bonds and then you die. <laughs> yeah. And the plan is not to die. So we don't do that. <laughs> yeah, we'll just never die. We'll just never die. It's going to be fine. No, yeah. We just go hundred percent equity and live forever. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, I love it because it's exactly what me and my wife are doing. Um, we do something that's called the glide path. So we've okay. been like gradually coming to 60, 40 as we were closing to getting closer to FI. And then from there, we've been moving back into equities from 60, 40 onward. Like gradually. Yeah, we're, we're, we're 70, 30 right now. And at the end, and right after this, we're going to go, we're going to look at our, all of our numbers and, and, and we're going to debate whether we want to go up to 75, 75 25. 25. Yeah. That's uh, probably the year. most uh, risk we, we are willing to take in retirement, 75, 25. Yeah. I think I'm going to top out at 75, maybe 80, 20, but she likes 75, 25. So this is like JL Collins, right? I think he's at 75, 25. Yeah. That's, yeah same. Yeah, similar. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Awesome. And so the, the process, because I, I mean, this is something I haven't heard you guys speak about, so I want to dig a bit more into it. Um, the process is you think about where you, where you stand in terms of expenses compared to your portfolio. And you're like, all right, so because we are withdrawing this much on a regular basis, we really only need so much in fixed income because that's kind of the base, right? Um, and the rest we can increase because we're not as reliant on it as we used to. I think I see how this works. It's like saying, we well, can apply the 60-40 uh, asset allocation to part of our portfolio because that's sort of what we were withdrawing from but the rest is sort of extra so, and that can stay in stocks because that's you know that's good we don't need, just, it. We don't need yeah. it and if it if it crumbles it crumbles if it goes up better better we have higher chances of having more in the future if it goes into stocks so yeah. let's do that you can afford because bonds to bonds forever that they just doesn't last right exactly. um, yeah cool and have you thought of what will happen? Like what would, what you would do when, when your portfolio is, you know, cause it's going to snowball at some point. <laughs> like, what happens when you hit like two, three, five millions? Is, is there, does something change? Like, have you thought of like, I don't know. I mean, there's some responsibility that comes with having even more than what you really need. Like, I don't know. What, what's your position on this? It's, a, it's already happening. We, uh, we, we <laughs> okay. So the game that we play is we, we left when we were millionaires in Canadian dollars. Yes. Then when we uh, crossed a million dollars as U.S. dollars, we were like, yes, that's a yes. real curve. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and, um, so just today we crossed a million in euros. Yeah, Yo, well done. And then after that, the next milestone pounds. is a million in pounds. So once yes. we're pounders, I think we're done. <laughs> <laughs> you millionaires yeah. everywhere. Yeah, yeah, the millionaires everywhere. I don't think there's any other current. Maybe Swiss francs might be more. No, it's no, very close to to the euro. Um, okay, very close yeah. to euro. No, pounds, pounds, pounds is the highest. Pounds is the highest. Yeah. What's really fun is transmi translating it to Vietnamese dong, in which you oh become, my like, god, it's like trillion. You become like a trillion, you know. Um, <laughs> Quit like uh, a trillionaire. But, move to yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> so uh, what? So, Three comma club. <laughs> so well, what happens there is, uh, yeah, there is the like the the temptation to I guess spend more money because it's just like why not. But uh, Chrissy, do you want to talk about why we haven't? Oh, okay. I've increased our cost of living. Yeah, because I mean, okay, so we have two por portfolios. This is this is to show transparency because one of the things that people worry about um, in terms of bloggers in the fire space is like, okay, but you, you have a blog and then if you have a book and you're making money, then are you living off that money? And then I can't do it because I don't have a book and I don't have a blog. So how is this 4% uh, rule safe? Um, so what we did was we actually separated the amount of money that we had originally uh, that we made from our work. And then we have a separate uh, portfolio that we don't touch. It's only for business expenses, like to you know help family out or any kind of donations and things like that are extraneous, not not part of the normal living expenses. So we're still living off the existing portfolio, and we are because this year we only spend thirty six thousand. We're projected to spend thirty six thousand dollars for the year. Um, the amount of money we're giving, we're getting in interest and dividends. So not even touching the capital of the portfolio, not selling anything, is enough to just cover the basic expenses. So everything else just becomes like extra, like bonus money whatever you want to do with that money right um and the thing is like people are like why don't you i don't know why don't you buy a yacht like why don't you buy <laughs> what is it like why don't you buy a i don't even know like mercedes why don't you drive that around or whatever or like why don't you buy a house and why do you buy all these things and i'm like okay all of those things sound like an assignment to me like it doesn't sound like like fun to me it sounds like a headache like I don't want to buy a yacht because now I have to like maintain it. Now I have to feel, I have to figure out like, where do I put my yacht? Now I have to like spend money to like deal with it. Like that's not something that I want to do at all. Like I'd rather just have the money and like, if it's, you know, find something that I like, a, a, like cause that I feel passionate about and then use that money towards that and like give my uh, family and friends money. Like 
gifts and like take them out to eat and things like that. That's like relationship oriented. Like that's more who I am as a person. So I think it, it really depends on your values. Like if you value buying yachts and if you value all those things, like just know that you have to work extra for that and you have to put in your time in, in exchange for that. And that makes you happy. That's totally fine. But for me, that doesn't make me happy. Like what makes me happy is making other people happy. So I would much rather like, and I'm already perfectly happy with the way my life is. So I don't need to um, inflate it in any way. So like that money is really like for friends, family, and like donations and, and business expenses. And also with Chrissy's personality, she actually finds like finding deals as like a competitive sport. Like, <laughs> one of her favorite things to do Optimize. during this pandemic is go on Airbnb or like deal.ca or whatever. And then just scroll, 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 and then look for like le- like deals of desperate landlords that are. <laughs> I love it. And then she will then take that. Then she will take that. Then when she finds a really good deal, she'll be like, "Ooh, let's move here." And then she'll go onto Zillow or whatever, and then find out how much the landlord paid for that house, and then calculate how much money. Yeah. Oh my god! <laughs> losing by renting to us, and then she just gets this weird grin on her face. <laughs> And, um, and, and, and then uh, it makes up for all the people that call us losers for renting all those years. So I'm like, Oh, how, how's it going for you now? Thank you so much for subsidizing my rent. I love you so much. <laughs> this, guy, this guy that we're renting for right now, I think they're, they're, he's losing three or $400 by renting to us. And then we're like, yes. Uh, Is he one of your readers? No, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> don't mix, don't mix friendship with money. Yeah. So, uh, we're, yeah, so we're, yeah, she, what she said, we're perfectly happy with the way that our lifestyle, our life is full and we get to do whatever we, the traveling that we want. Actually spending more money would actually not help. It would stress us out. We're one of the few people, like not one of the few people, but if someone said you should, if someone handed us a private jet, she would start panicking because she, uh, Oh yeah. I would break she, out in hides. I'm like, I she's don't, like, no, it's because no. small planes stress her out. Okay. <laughs> she, was much, she feels much safer flying on like a giant 747 yes. commercial yeah. than on a private jet. A private jet is a panic attack. No. So, <laughs> so, okay. so it's like spending money actually makes her life worse. If that makes any sense. You know, you know it's, a, it's actually a curve, right? If you don't have like when I grew up poor and it was like really sucky, yeah, you're not going to be happy and you're, you're gonna, your health is going to suffer when you're poor. You don't choose that, but it does happen. And then when you have enough money, um, then you're like quite happy and you're secure and you have enough. But then there's a turning point in which it actually goes the other way. Like if it's too much money, you actually get a lot of headaches that are associated with like other problems that you never would have thought of. Like you, now you have to hire security. Now, like all these family members are asking for, for money. And if you don't give them enough money, they're not happy. And then now it's like, you have to guard the money. And then now it becomes a headache, right? And you, you if you buy all these fancy houses and mansions, now you have to like employ people and now you have to worry about their well being. And then now you have all these things you have to maintain. So it really is like a curve, like enough money. You, you want to get to that sweet spot of just enough to cover your expenses and to make you happy and give you what you want, but not to the point where it's like you're spending money on so much stuff that you don't need. And it's just conti- continuous headache. I believe it's the financial principle of more money, more problems. <laughs> yeah, exactly. From a certain yes. point. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I totally relate with that. I mean, we like to keep our lives simple and spending stuff, spending money on stuff just makes it more complicated. And I don't know. There's something that comes with the five, which is super valuable, which is it's peace of mind and not having to worry about stuff. Right. Yeah. And it just, it's, you can't buy that. And uh, actually it's the opposite. The more you spend, the, the more you lose. <laughs> there was a revealing interview with Donald Trump, like right before the election, where, oh, yeah? he, was, where he was kind of saying like, I, why did I, like, my life was great before this. It was like, <laughs> and he's like, why am I, it was kind of like, why am I doing this? And we're all like, yeah, why yeah, are you why? doing this? Because it's like before people would be like, Don, let's go to a, let's go out for dinner, right? And then he would be like, okay. And he would just hop into the car and he would just go. And then now he can't. Like none of his friends call him anymore. Everybody <laughs> wants something from him. Everyone was like, oh, Mr. President, Mr. President. He doesn't have any friends. And like half the country hates him. So it's just kind of like, like, like what, what was the point of all of that? Like he's not even, like he's not, like he's a rich guy, but he does not look happy. <laughs> no, yeah. And I can, I can picture how he was happier before, especially after the recent events. Yeah. Uh, so one last question on, on the investing stuff. And sorry, I really, I wanted to dig into this because as I said, it's, it's quite new for a lot of people in Belgium. So I, I wanted to have a lot. And you guys basically, you gave us so much here. Um, what I want to say f- for everyone listening to this is like your guys, your workshop on your website, there are a gold mine because you go in so much detail to help so many different people with different situations and you answer so many different questions. Um, like anyone who wants to learn how to invest, 
I think your workshops are the best place to go. Maybe just after Jill Collins talk series. I hope you don't mind if I say that. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. You and I are good friends. Yeah. And I would oh, say, his, yeah. like, like, make sure you get the book because there's life wisdom in here. I love the, the scarcity versus abundance mindset discussions. I, I, love, I love all of the discussions around the, the, the yield shield. Uh, and I mean, there's so much more in here. And I want people to go and like, I'm not, I don't want you to explain it here because I want people to go and get it from here because like they need to know about both of those massive concepts. Um, but I want to I do one last thing on, on the investing side before, before we move to a, a slightly different topic. It's like, obviously there will be market crashes. No? And index investors... Like say there's a new new index investor, someone who started like in the past two, three years, right? And he's, yeah, say there, there was March, but he didn't have that much money in, in there yet. And it was sort of building and sort of he managed to, to handle the little, the little hiccup of, uh, of March or March, March, April this year. Um, but say in the year or two, there's a massive, massive crash. Mm-hmm. How does that person hold on? Like what's, what's your advice? What's your strategy for someone who hasn't, doesn't have the experience of 2008, which you guys have, You've lived through that in a way, maybe not completely all in with your investments, but you've gone through that. So you understand like someone who's just starting and like market crashes, like what, what's, what's the strategy? How do we, how do we manage? Oh, it's scary. It's scary. The first time we were investing, it was like, we, we, I started investing, like putting the money seriously into the market right at like September, 2008. And, and then went, and yeah. it, it felt like I was setting my money on fire. Um, it, uh, Cause I would, I would put a thousand dollars into the stock market and then it would literally be like a thousand dollars less the next day. So it just, Looks like my, my money was just being set on fire. Um, so it's important that you understand the principles of why you're doing what you're doing, that the, that the index funds cannot go to zero and will eventually bounce back. And what you're doing as markets are crashing, if you're holding stocks, you might kind of go, if you're holding individual stocks, it's very tempting to kind of go, oh my God, I'm scared, run to cash, sell it before it goes to zero. With index funds, this, the index always recovers because some companies will go bankrupt. Some companies will do abnormal, like, like surprisingly well, and then new companies will be formed and then the index will, 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 will rebound again. So um, 2008 was a great example of that. You know, it, it, it wiped out a lot of financial companies, but Airbnb got created there. Nobody knew, like Airbnb was created in the middle of the 2008 and there was an idea, like it was under the idea of, hey, everyone's, everyone's hurting right now. So rent out your room and make, make a little bit of money to get you through this, right? That's how Airbnb got created. Nobody knew that it would become this giant juggernaut that it is today. And Airbnb success is what caused, is one of the factors that caused the stock market to rebound. So what you want to do in a market crash is whatever you do, the best thing to do in a market crash is to buy more of it because you're picking up more units at a discount and then you'll be able to participate in the rebound much more sharply than you participate in the downside. That's what, that's what happened in 2008. Um, the worst thing you can do is sell because you're going to be locking in um, a temporary loss. Um, and, the, and, if, and if you don't have any cash, it's okay to hold it. But the important thing is not to sell during a downturn because that's how you actually lose money. If you just hold it or buy more during a downturn, you'll always eventually be proven right in the end. I think what helps is seriously just step step away from the computer and stop reading the news. Like that is the worst thing you could do is just reading all the news and everything that could go wrong. And like, I must do something because if I don't do anything, then I, I'm like, everything's going to go shit and I haven't, I'm going to blame myself. No, don't look at the news, step away from your um, brokerage account and just like do some meditation. Seriously. Like Jim actually created, JL Collins created a, a meditation track for this exact purpose. Um, like the, the reason why we know this is because we have been through it. We, ha- we were those people that were freaking out during 2008 and saying like, oh my God, do we need to sell? Like putting your hand over the button, like finger over the button, the sell button and going, I, I should probably press this. Right. And thank God we didn't because we wouldn't be in this situation right now. Right. So um, I, I think a, a big part of it is, is thinking about, I think one of my favorite qu- quotes from uh, Warren Buffett is how he looks at his, um, he looks at the stocks and his portfolio, not from a daily point of view or a weekly point of view or, or a monthly point of view. He looks at it, everything from like five years, 10 years, 15 years. It, it really is about the long game and not about like day trading, day-to-day moves. If you concentrate on the day-to-day moves, you're going to drive yourself crazy. Like we, because we got through 2008 and we became financially independent today is the fact that we did not dwell on the day-to-day moves of the stock market during 2008. We t- like eventually turned off the television, stopped watching the news and stopped freaking, about, freaking out every single day because that, that's not good for your psyche. Go download JL Collins' meditation record and just listen to that. <laughs> Jim actually has, tells a story at the beginning of his talk at Chautauqua where he kind of goes, Fidelity or somebody like did a, did a survey of all the accounts that they, oh, yeah. uh, that uh, the investment yeah. accounts that 
and they try to figure out which groups of people perform better that outperform the people. And the, 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 the group that performed the best were dead people. <laughs> the, sec- the group that performed the second best were people that forgot that they opened an account in the first place because they weren't doing anything. They were just hold- buying and holding, which is the exact right thing to do. So just act like a dead person. <laughs> yeah. Invest like a dead person. <laughs> that's a book right there. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. That's a book. Or a blog name. Oh, well, I, I bet it exists that's already. Like <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you for that, guys. Uh, I mean, this is this is like a, a crash course of index investing, and I'm hoping you know we have 75 people here, 70 now, but like, and then if, all the people who are going to watch this later, like, so much value. So thanks a lot for that. I, I love I love to hear about um, you know your your other journeys in your lives, like the, the other things that drive you forward. And I mean, you since you retired and even before, you were writers entrepreneurs movement builders with with your with your blog like today today what you know aside from all this money and fi stuff what drives you and like what's the stuff that that you you push forward like i would say obviously fi is a very big part of that i know like what else is going on you know um what i find interesting is there's actually different stages of retirement and i didn't know this because now that we've been retired for like over five years now you 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 learn it as you go um so what happens when you're working is that you're just so stressed out you have no time to think about anything but work so you just want to get out you're just desperately like i need to get out I, i i can't do this anymore i need to get out so you have that mindset of like i need to decompress i need freedom so that's your first and you just work towards FI like your life depends on it. Like that's what I did. I thought I think that's a little unhealthy. I, I probably if I could do it again, I probably would not be so intense about it because you need to enjoy the process. It's not always the goal. But at the time I was just like so set on like need to become FI, need to get out of here. Um, so that's like the first stage of like the striving to become FI. And then once you reach your number, you're like, oh my God, I totally reached it. And like, I, you're so happy. You're like doing a victory lap around the world. You're patting yourself on the back and you're like, yes, my life is going to be perfect and happy forever and ever. And it is for the first six months because you're, you're decompressing, you're traveling. It's like everything you've ever imagined. You have all the time in the world. Every single day feels like 10 times longer because you actually have all this time to do whatever <laughs> it is that you want to do. Um, but then after about two years, then you get to the period in which you're like, okay, um, what else am I going to do with my life? Because now I've decompressed, now I'm energized. And then you go into another period in which you're like ambitious again. You're like, I need to take on all these projects, passion projects, opportunities, talks, books, TV, everything. And then now you, you've become a, another, now you're, now you're climbing the corporate ladder again, but in a different way. Now you're climbing your, your passion ladder. You're like, now I'm going to do all these things. And then there's another stage in which you get burned out. So that, that was us last year from like all the book stuff and the talk and stuff like that. And you're like, there, there were certain days in which it's like, how come I'm working more than like doing book promotion than when I was actually having a job? Like, do I need to retire from retirement? Like what is happening here? <laughs> so, so then you get into that stage and you're like, oh, wait, 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 wait. I'm climbing a ladder again. Like, what am I doing? I should not be doing this. And then, so now like you're, you're now, now in, now I'm more in the happiness mindset and like, like it's more important to exist and be happy and be present rather than always trying to project for the future and like, what's the next thing? What's the next thing? So now we're in a very like peaceful part of fire in which um, it's really about the human relationships and it really is about family and your, your personal health. Like our health has increased significantly after we retired. Like I used to have back pain. I used to have, like, I used to have to go to the physiotherapist because I had a lot of really bad wrist pain and I had to wear like a, a guard and I had really bad back pain. That is all gone now. I don't have any of that. I had to take antidepressants. I had to be on anti-anxiety medication. I don't take, I don't take any of that medication now. Um, and then one of the best things that happened um, as a result of becoming financial independent is like, this year we actually had a really bad family emergency um so like having that time to be able to support your family and be there for them is priceless like you you can't buy this kind of you you like you'll never the thing is once you lose your family member they're gone forever like you're never going to buy that time back it's it's precious it's more important than any amount of money and there's nothing that you can use to buy that back so i think that is the number one benefit we've gotten out of financial independence like the ability to have the time to support your family member i I love it so much. And I feel like you're reading my mind on so many things. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a pattern that we've noticed. I mean, like there's always that, there's always that existential crisis thing. And then yeah, like, we kind of all, like, like these phases, on. they really are something that we observe in a similar way. I'm kind of in this hyper phase with so many things I want to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But the, like, I'm, I'm looking forward to the next phase where I can just be like, okay, yeah. it's okay, just relax. <laughs> the zen phase, yeah. That's yeah, yeah. 
that's gonna you're gonna look you you you, you could look forward to that if yeah i had a little bit of zen phase it's true the first yeah. six months were like the total zen phase yeah i love that yeah. i need yeah. to go back to that but uh, yeah it'll come soon <laughs> <laughs> once i get over all the stuff that i'm trying to do um cool um all right well thank you i mean Thank you so much for sharing all of this and the super, super important wisdom. I mean, we have like a lot of questions in the Q&A. Um, and so for everyone who hasn't asked the question yet, there yet, there's 30. We're not going to do all 30. But feel free to go into the Slido uh, link that we shared and um, ask your question, although they'll be at the very bottom most likely. Uh, or everyone, please go through the questions and upvote the ones you like most because we're going to go through them now. Um, and I'll start with the one that's at the top, yeah? Right, so sure. people can actually put their name if they want, but most people have asked question anonymously. Uh, but right, so first question, how much did you guys save each year during those three years? I think that's the three years between when you realize you could do it until, so 2012, 2015, I think that is. Um, yeah. what, did you, what did you do with that money? I think that's the question. But so, okay. Yeah, so we have an exact breakdown in, in the back of our book, in the appendix, where we list out like all the um, exact uh, savings numbers and the, um, the amount that we invested and how much our salaries were. Uh, so it actually changed each year because in the beginning, when you just got, get out of university, you know, you don't have as much money to put towards it. Uh, but on average, we were putting around like 100,000 uh, away. Um, at like pretty much at the highest point because uh, once we found out about financial independence, it was just like drive towards the goal. Um, yeah. So if you want the exact information of how much Appendix we spent, B? Getting it there. Yep. Yes, that's it. Yeah. So okay, there's guys, like, sorry, down. you have to go read the book. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of charts in there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, For the, all the math nerds, all there's the a nerds. lot of there's a lot of charts. So a hundred thousand dollars Canadian, right? So everyone, mm -hmm. like, don't get too scared. Um, <laughs> But it's it's still it's a feat. I mean, like how were you able to save so much? Like this is actually the next question. Like how do how is that even possible? Because yeah, I mean, just tell us a little bit. Yeah, I think being engineers definitely helped. Like having two engineering salaries helped a lot. Uh, number the second one, growing up poor helped a lot, <laughs> um, because like if you have those salaries, the thing is people think that if you have a like massive salary, that's all you need to do to be rich. But actually, a lot of people in the world. The, the richest people are not actually the people with the highest salaries. The, the people with the highest salaries actually end up spending a lot of their money. They end up like, there's a thing called lifestyle inflation that whenever you get a promotion, it's not like, oh, I'm going to take this amount that I got for the promotion and put it into my savings. No, people don't do that. They take the amount that they get for the promotion and they just upgrade the house or they upgrade their car or they upgrade whatever it is. Um, for, so we didn't fall for the, any of that life, life, lifestyle inflation because of my, my background. Um, I think an, another thing that was really, really helpful was the fact that because we were renting, we could predict exactly how much our expenses were going to be. It was very easy to project out for the next five years how much our expenses were going to be. Because if you have a house, you um, like property tax could increase, you, your roof could collapse one day, and then all of a sudden you're out $5,000, you're out $10,000. You can't really predict what's going to happen. Um, so renting helped us a lot. Not having a car helped a lot. Um, I know that in some cities, I know for like, that's another um, amazing thing about Europe being European. You guys have such good public transit. It's amazing. Like the fact that you can rely on public transit saves you a ton of money. Cause I have a lot of friends that are constantly running into car problems. It's like, boom, all of a sudden, um, you know, they have to like their insurance went up. So now all of a sudden they have to cough up all this money for the car. Um, the car is breaking down. Now they have to spend $5,000 fixing the car. And then all of a sudden you can't keep track of any of that money anymore either. Um, so I think the biggest thing for us was like no lifestyle in inflation. It definitely helped having two engineering salaries and then tracking everything, like knowing exactly where you're going is very important. If you just say, oh, I'm doing fine. I'm like I, everything, like I'm not getting into in debt, but I'm not going to look at my numbers. Uh, it's like trying to drive somewhere, but you have no map. So you, you don't know how you're doing and you don't really know if you're going towards a goal. So, so tracking was really, really important to us. Like what else was important to us, do you think? Uh, yeah, so it's like we do this exercise in the book where we're kind of like, because uh, budgeting is not, we don't like to talk about budgeting in terms of like deprivation because mm -hmm. we don't want people to be like eating canned beans in like uh, around a fire. Yeah, that's not fun. That's not fun <laughs> and it's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. But what's, uh, what the important thing is, tracking is important because if you can't, if you don't know where you are, you can't figure out where, the, where your money is going. Yeah. And identifying areas in which like certain spending adds, adds uh, happiness to your life. So for example, food is a very big important like she she's from Sichuan province in China and spicy food is a big part of 
her oh, culture. Yeah. And if she didn't have spicy food, then she'd be very, very sad. But she doesn't drink coffee. Like, it's just it's not. Just, it gives me stomach aches. Yeah, <laughs> just she doesn't can't like do coffee. Yeah. So, like, th that whole, like, do, stop going to Starbucks advice doesn't work on us because we like, I already don't go to Starbucks. Yeah, we already don't go to Starbucks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, fine. So, it's like finding the, the amount that you're spending, like, the surprise spending that you're spending on things that don't make you happy. Like, well, an example of this is for, um, uh, people that have written into us and like, I don't know where all my money is going. I look at their budget and it's like, they have like five, they have like three or four different streaming services. Like they have Netflix and they have Amazon prime and they have HBO and they have like all these different like, like streaming services. And it's like, do you watch all of them at once? And they're like, no. So it's like, well, why don't you just only have one at a time? And then when you're done with all that library, you just turn it or suspend it and then go to the next thing. So you can still watch everything, but instead of, you know, a hundred dollars a month that you're spending all these things, it's like 20 or like 10, right? And so that's an example of like finding spending that you don't realize that is not actually making you happy. Uh, like bank fees are a good one. Nobody likes paying bank fees. So like if you're finding that you're spending a lot of money on stuff like that, then you can figure out what to eliminate. And if the stuff didn't bring you happiness, eliminating that is not going to feel like deprivation because oh, like no one's going to be like, oh, I miss my bank fees, right? It's like, you know, so th that's the kind of exercise that you kind of need to do. But tracking is the first step towards doing that because you can't, um, you can't target and find anything if you don't know where all your spending is. So, so true. And this is, I mean, the very basis, right? This is how it started for me. And I remember, um, like what we talked about resilience uh, and how that's a trigger for people to actually get better. I'm, I'm sort of combining, I'm coming back to that story that we talked about earlier, but at some point I was broke. The reason I am here today and speaking to you guys is because I, at some point I was broke. I was forced to actually start tracking my expenses because I had no money and I had no home and <laughs> just no pension, nothing. I, had, I really was in a difficult situation. And so like it was a challenging time and it helped me build resilience and I started tra tracking and that has been the key to everything. Like it's, it's funny because we talked about resilience before um, and now we talk about tracking and for me, these two are the, the key ingredients that, are, that led to everything else. But uh, so yeah, so super powerful. Anyone who's uh, really taking this journey seriously, I think tracking is the key. And then the rest kind of comes naturally, right? Because when you track, you see. And when right. you see, then you, you can make decisions and realize what's, what makes sense and what doesn't. And that's, that's such a big step forward already. Um, so we have questions, but I, I noticed that they were asked earlier uh, during the talk. So when you hadn't answered some of the questions yet, um, we can clarify this. What's your main source of income now? Uh, we talked a bit about this, but let's clarify it completely. Um, passive income from the portfolio. So we live basically on the combination of the dividends and the interest um, coming from our coming from our investments. And that's what we, you spend half hour a year on, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. We do we do make some extra money on the book and the blog, but we those are it's kind of extra fun spending, and you know we we spend it on business expenses, gifts, massages, that kind of stuff. <laughs> Love it. Um, what? Where where do you plan to settle once you both feel like you like settling down uh, and when you're done traveling? You know, it's interesting. Uh, what we realized during the pandemic is uh, it, it is very important to be around your family. And that's what a lot of people are asking. Like if you have a digital nomad lifestyle or a nomadic lifestyle, you're never going to see your family again. Like, isn't that going to be very challenging? Um, so what, what we were thinking is like maybe somewhere in the middle where you can see your family for maybe five months of the year where it's livable in Canada, where, you know, there isn't snow. It's from like, the weather is nice and it's summertime. You get to have like barbecues with your family. But then like the first snowflake that falls on my forehead, I'd be like <laughs> out of here. Like I'm going to go to like Portugal or maybe I'm going to go to Southeast Asia and then come back when the weather is nice again so that I can balance uh, my love of travel. And like, we also have a lot of friends in Europe and we have friends in Asia. Um, so like our communities all over the world, they're not just fixed in one spot. So we can balance the family and the friends and our desire to travel as well. Um, so again, it's, it goes back to that flexibility thing, right? You can, you can design your life however you want it to, to be designed um, if you are flexible. So for us personally, it, it would be splitting our time with family and then the rest of the time running away from the Canadian weather. Uh, <laughs> There's this idea that, um, uh, that when you travel enough, you get it out of your system and, and then you want to settle down. It actually gets the desire to travel actually gets worse stronger, stronger <laughs> the more you travel uh, for us anyway 
So uh, the idea that, oh, we get out of our system, we decide to settle down. I don't think that's ever going to happen. Like uh, my, my intention, even if we have kids, is to continue traveling with the kids and, and, and build that life out, like, like out there on the road. Because I don't think I could ever, like this is the longest period of time that we ever spent in one city. And even then, we're still like moving around in the city once like every month. Yeah, we, like we can't different... stand it and stay in one area. Yeah, I, like, like your brain turns to mush after, like for me anyway, like, <laughs> my brain needs to be stimulated. Yeah. I need yeah. to have problems to solve in like new environments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, interesting. I, I, so me and my wife, we had a similar plan. So stop, stop working, get to a five. Well, get to a five, stop working and travel, right? Um, but then we decided to have kids and okay. our plans changed. <laughs> and, I, you know, I th initially, I think three, four years ago, I was still thinking, yeah, but once he's one year old, as soon as he can carry his own backpack, we'll be on the road, no? Like go curry cracker style. <laughs> and uh, I would love to just be able to, obviously COVID happened, no? So it kind of, we don't really have the choice. But yeah, I think I changed my mind a bit on this and we are, we're now looking at really being for several years very close to family with the kids so that kids can be with grandparents. It's kind of this thing that, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, this is something that played a big role in our decision. But now we don't even have a choice. We can't, we can't travel. Uh, but yeah, I want to say, like, I, I was looking at, at it the same way. There's an interesting question that's related to this. Someone's asking, obviously the answer would be no, but <laughs> would you have achieved the same goal if you had two kids at the start of your relationship? Um, like, it's like, if you were not in your situation, can you actually do it? No, but like, how would kids and family change, change the journey, um, if at all? People do it with kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, uh, Justin from Good of Good, he has three kids and he did the, the financial independence thing. There's like, actually a lot of people with kids in the fire community. Yeah. 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 Kids are also one of these things where people think they, they cost a lot of money, but they, it's like they can in that kids can cost infinite amount of money if you let them. But like how he does it for it is like, um, like he, uh, both Go Curry Cracker, like Justin or Jeremy from Go Curry Cracker and Justin from, uh, from Good of Good, broke down like how much they spend on their on, on their kids and it's and there's there's kind of like parenting hacks that you can do as well and like, it's even cheaper in belgium <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 so uh so we're not experts on that because we don't have kids but it's it's still it is still possible uh yeah. you just have to kind of follow those guys yeah there's um there's a chapter in the book in which we interview other people in the fire space who have kids to get their idea like get their numbers about how much they're actually spending on kids and what their thoughts on whether it's possible to do the fi thing with kids because that's a question that gets asked a lot yeah i bet because yeah when if you find out about this after having kids and it's easy to say well all of these people are single or without kids and obviously you know but uh you know from my perspective it's just, you just turn the numbers a bit differently. You make it work anyway. It might take a little longer. You have to find the kid's hack, and, but it works, right? The system is the same. You probably even have more motivation because spending time with kids is so valuable. You kind of want to make it work fast. Oh um, yeah, that's actually a question I want to ask you. So yeah. the same, same question, if you get, for that, the same question goes to you. Like <laughs> now that you do have a kid, yeah. how would that have changed your, your plan to become FI? If you had that when you were working towards FI? I think we, so, Towards the end of our planning time, we did know we wanted kids. And so obviously we would have, you know, we had to think of the cost that it brings. And we did a bit of research around and most people say it does cost a lot, but mostly because they have to send kids to what is called here, crash, which is, um, what is it in English? Um, uh, daycare. And that is it's fairly expensive, mm -hmm. but that's not an expense for someone who doesn't have to go to work. And who can, if he works, work from home, right? Which is our case. So we didn't have that expense. And then it just happens that in Belgium, there's a lot of support for kids. Schooling, if you go through the traditional system, which is excellent, is practically free. Yeah, they have extra expenses, but it's nothing insane. So we just, we just went with a, with a budget that was slightly higher, but not very much higher. It didn't change very much um, the whole FI thing. Um, also because... As you've probably noticed, towards the end of the FI journey or trying to get to FI, things just get better and better. No? <laughs> uh, you just you find optimization things in different places. The market tends to do better. At work, you get just you get paid more, even if you didn't ask for it. So, like that, combined with the fact that we had a higher budget, basically made that our fire date didn't really change. Um, now, if we had had kids earlier, it might have been different uh, because then I think, like being a dad now, I think I would have happily slowed down my journey to fi just to be with my kids and like give up 
salary for sure easy like the, how much i don't know but um takes time off maybe like i think the first few years of kids are so precious i probably would have just completely stopped the fi thing for a while and then get back to it later um uh, i don't know but i would have found ways to bring the benefits of fi into my life at that point right because that's when it's really most needed um and we, you talked about you know the massive mountain that is fi and how you have to enjoy the process and the journey. I think one of the ways is just financial security, as you said, and like once you have a bit of financial security, there's so many things you can do. And, and for me, like doing that for your kids is like one of the most amazing things you can do. So, um, but we haven't, we didn't have to do it. We were kind of lucky that it was super well-timed. <laughs> Literally, if I, just a few months before he was born. Um, but I think we would have delayed um, just to be with him. Like this is, yeah especially now having gone through it. I don't know if I would have had made that decision without knowing what it is to be a father. But now that I know, like, uh, that's definitely what I recommend. Um, yeah, yeah. Like life before FI, like to bring the benefits to FI in life today. That's like definitely super important. Uh, unless you're just a few months away and just have to like sort of survive for a few months and then you can enjoy time forever with your kid, then maybe that's, you know, that's okay. But if you have a long way to go, then just make the decisions to be happy now and to enjoy time with your kids now. Um, same as you know same as what you would do if you have someone who's sick in your family and really des- needs your help and you to be there i think this is the, the, the advice still applies there too um but yeah that's kind of my view now cool. Wow. cool um all right um what would you advise people who are just at the beginning of the investment journey where to start because it is it is overwhelming it is like a mountain like the, only the investment part, not even the FI thing. Where do people start? Uh, well, yeah, it's like, you're right. It's, like, it's kind of like, not like one lesson, but it's like a series of things that you have to learn in sequence in order to figure it out. So the best place to start is obviously um, our blog. So we, run in, we, yeah. we wrote a series of articles, like step by step. Here are all the concepts that you need to learn. In Highly one. recommended. Please, everyone. <laughs> and so everybody has the link to your blog because it was part of the invite. And I will send it again. It will be in the show, in the description as well, in the notes for sure. Yeah. Um, that, that, that's how I, where I always direct people. Yeah, that's the best place to start. Um, and there's a lot there. I think, you know, um, the advice that you have there is, is, uh, is universal. It works for everyone. And I think for the tax aspects, then you just have to adapt it to where you live uh, right. when, when there's something like that. But otherwise, the rest is really easily transferable to anywhere you live. Yeah, the only caution for European readers that I should probably put in there is that I, like I, I say, you know, investing in the S and P five hundred and in in the blog, I, I, I'm assuming people are either Canadian or American, and as a result, I go, okay, buy these ETFs that are trade on the New York Stock Exchange directly. If Europe, uh, if you guys do that and you're not a U.S. citizen, there's um, consequences uh, for inheritance tax. So it's really important that you buy what are called USITs. What the hell, do you know what USITs stand for? It's an acronym for like, um, what was it? I can't recall, but it's, it's like a pooled investment managed by this and that. And the, the I stands for investment for sure. Okay, so <laughs> a, a, USIT is, a USIT was created so that, um, so, that you, so that if you're not from that country, like it doesn't, uh, it's uh, compatible with your tax laws so that you don't get these like massive hits or something like that. So, so that's the only uh, uh, caution if you're, uh, if you're in European, make sure that what you buy has U-C-I-T-S as, as part of the name. Yeah. And in Belgium specifically, um, investing through Irish domicile ETFs, accumulating, not registered in Belgium, which is an odd thing to do. These are like the, the best ways of optimizing. Um, and in the community, which we are part of, like we all talk about this all the time. So they're easy to find. So anyone who's watching this, join Financial Independence Belgium, the Facebook group, uh, or check on firebelgium.com. There's you know, a lot of information there, especially on this. And, and it's like, it's exactly what you need on top of, uh, you know, Millionaire Revolution workshops, because there you get a lot, a lot, a lot of, uh, you know, all the philosophy and strategy and then if you need the details of how to implement then it's all it's all in the belgian side for sure it looks like patrick wrote down what usit stands for it's undertakings for collective investment in transferable securities wow that is a mouthful of course yes why that's you? why nobody remembers <laughs> oh, you to remember. what a stupid name <laughs> but look as long as an i in there and it says investment you're like okay we know what yeah, it is, Moritz. It's transferable <laughs> securities. It's, it's, it's basically designed for EU citizens so that it, it's, it's like compatible with the, the EU laws. So there's someone asking, what's your, 
what's your plans from for for children you talked about maybe you maybe like whether you have children or not do you you don't have to tell us but do you have plans and it's fine if you say we prefer not to talk about it yeah i mean if we end up having kids um our my, so i have a, i have a different perspective from the other people who are in canada like to me it's very important for them to be absorbed in their culture because i grew up in china so i i i really like the idea of them living abroad like somewhere it doesn't have to be the first you know formative years maybe not when they're like in the very beginning i'd probably be very busy like you said and relying on family but at some point i want to go to taiwan so that they can be immersed in the culture and learn how to speak mandarin like for me that's very very important um so again it's it's comes down to flexibility again right so like if i decide to change my mind and or maybe the kid needs more support than i'm ex- of staying maybe near parents grandparents um but uh i think travel is is going to be part of our life in some shape or form and if we don't end up having kids and it's not our choice and it just doesn't happen then definitely travel forever <laughs> then yeah. it's like nothing is tying us down then i want to learn as much about the world as possible and i want to visit our community which is actually spread around the world right so like the way i put it is it's kind of like you're you know you're visiting your friends in different neighborhoods in the same city for, so the neighborhoods are different countries and the entire world is the city for us yeah that's a nice way of looking at it And all thanks to Ryanair's 10 pound tickets to wherever. <laughs> thanks, Ryanair. thanks Ryanair. Oh, are they your sponsors? I didn't know. <laughs> cool. There's a question that's really interesting here. Um how do, how do you deal with sentimental items that you own? Do you keep them and store them? Do you dispose of them? We take a picture of them and set it on fire. <laughs> 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 the picture or the item? <laughs> um I we have some stuff in his mom's basement. Yeah. I think sentimental things are base like I'm not that sentimental. I do have some things that I have from my friends that I, are in a box in her basement. Um but I think for yeah, some people put their stuff into storage. Um some people leave it with family and friends. Uh I think for us going on our, our friends are kind of our friends and family are are pretty familiar with our lifestyle now like in the beginning they just thought we were crazy and this was a phase yeah. <laughs> now they're like okay 5 years is not exactly a phase i think this might actually be who they are as a person as people and so they have resorted to giving us more like electronic versions like instead of giving us like you know some sort of like uh, a picture of us in a comic form like they all actually like have it scanned so that we can actually take it with us on the computer, <laughs> yeah. uh, on the laptops wherever we go and on our phones um and uh yeah so i i think it depends on what type of person you are if you're very sentimental then you know you may want to put it in storage or put it in in someone's home and later on if you want to settle down then then you can get those items back Yeah, I I think our sentimental stuff is basically down to like one box and it's sitting in my mom's basement. And I can go see it anytime I want. We're probably most sentimental about our portfolio. We're like, "Ah, look at our portfolio." Yeah. I love all this. Yeah. We're just like petting can it. Can you can you frame it? Yes. <laughs> That's what we do. I guess <laughs> you get like a share certificate, like you know, you could actually get it printed out or like sent to you. They don't have those anymore. Just po- print out the prospectuses and just put it as a wallpaper. It's like a screen. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Not the same. And the wallpaper on your on your computer for sure. Cuz like I thought that one of the most fun things about being a millionaire is getting all the cash out as like $5 bills and then filling up a swimming pool with it. <laughs> like, like, swim, swim around in it. Like but, Scrooge but, McDuck. But we never got they they don't, they don't let you do that. It's no. just yeah. like it's all electronic. Can I don't imagine? think there's enough uh, bills of five dollars for you guys to do that. <laughs> and I probably got a lot of paper. Cuts. Yeah, that's that's gonna be painful. That's yeah. a lot of paper cuts. Yeah. So it's... also during COVID, do you really want that much like money that people are touching everywhere yeah, around you? Fine, fine. Maybe not, not very good for social distancing. <laughs> so I never got to do that. In a But you can buy a lot of boxes of Monopoly and then do it in Monopoly. Uh, oh yes, yeah. Monopoly money. Okay. Yes. That should be pretty safe. There you go. Plus, if you set it on fire, it's still okay. <laughs> totally fine. Yeah. Depends how much the box costs, though. Yeah. Ah, good point. Sorry. Random. Um uh, there's there's more questions but they only have a few likes. So guys if you want more answers uh, you can like more. I have one one more question. Um it's not really a question it's like one of the concepts that you guys brought to Shitakwa two years ago it was already two years ago more than two years. Um which I love because I use it every day in my life. And that's the concept of the suit of armor. Um For those who don't know what it is, can you tell us a bit what that means? Yeah. 
Um, so like people think in the fire community that financial independence is more like a parachute, right? Like I'm going to put on this parachute then I'm going to jump like the, their job is this burning building. They're just like jumping out of the wreckage of their burning building of their job and then they're just, <laughs> yeah. like, floating away on this parachute. Uh, but the way we like to think of financial independence is actually more like a, a suit of armor because w- what it does, it, it, especially during times like this where there's like financial, um, you know, insecurity when there's like things that you can, that are outside your control, it, 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 it's really protective. It's your shield against anything that comes up. And with so many of like once in a life gen- time gen- generation black swan events, you just never know what's going to happen next. Right. Um, for me, especially because um, I chose to become um, like an engineer instead of the writer that I wanted to be because I didn't have that shield. Right. If I didn't work, I wasn't able to get a job as a writer. I couldn't make enough money as a writer. I would be homeless. Like I wouldn't be able to rely on my parents. I don't want to like drag them down with me um, and like rely on them. I I wanted to rely on myself, but because I was able to um, become financially independent and put on this, this FI armor, now I can actually be um, an author. Now I can actually do writing for a living. And if I don't make enough money, it doesn't matter because I have the armor on because I have enough money to live on. I don't have to worry about, failing at that dream i can actually just pursue it so once you have this armor like you're basically invincible there's so many things that you can achieve that you never thought was possible and you don't have to worry about um some some uncontrollable event like the pandemic coming around and all of a sudden your job is gone right like that's the thing people don't realize jobs are no longer stable like you you can't just think oh I'll just i have a job i'm getting fine i'll i'll, do, I'll be fine until i'm 65. Uh, jobs can disappear at any time and and the last 10 years has shown us that anything can happen and you just don't know what's, what's going to happen going forward. You, you need an armor to protect you because um, nobody can predict the future. So, I agree so much with you. And I would say start building that armor, right? Because in the end, it's not like, yes, it's, it's nice to have the full armor, but what matters is to have protection. And just the more protection you have, the safer you are, the the more bold you can be, the more confident you can be at work and in your relationships and everything, and you prepared for the worst and just makes life better, right? But just building that armor like piece by piece or layer by layer, I don't know whichever way you want to go. I think it's super powerful. Um, I, I love this idea because it's easy to picture yourself protected in that thing, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas it's difficult to imagine money working for you in the stock market. It's kind of a fluffy thing that's out there is kind of an abstract concept the armor is super super clear and it costs a lot yes but it's good investment (laughs) even if you just have the helmet right that's your emergency fund you just have the helmet you don't have the rest of it you again you're better off than 75 percent of the entire population of the united states like think about how valuable that is like you have six months of savings for example of living expenses this pandemic hit right? And now you don't have a job. Like you're not going to be immediately out on the street. You, you can t- take time to breathe. You can take time to look for another job. You can take time to sleep at night. You can re-energize yourself. You can spend time with your family. That is huge. What, that's, versus, in the end, that's what life is for, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So just even partial armor will, will make your life that much better because you don't have to worry about this something coming along and then you get punched in the face and you just don't know what to do. You can't think. Let's do it. Let's, let's build armors. I mean, yeah. that's what we're here for. Well, thanks. Thank you guys for uh, like sharing all of this important wisdom. I mean, wisdom, it's, you've been changing people's lives. You've changed my life already just through your writings uh, a few years ago. Um, and you, you keep doing that. And it's really awesome because, because like it, it makes such a big difference not to know or not to know what you guys are sharing. Like for me, it was, it's worth 32 years of my life, <laughs> right? So what you're sharing is worth decades of, of life, of freedom, of quality, of security, of being able to spend time with the people you really love and like not have to stress. And just such a, like, the change is so important. Like we need this thing to be out there anyway. That's why I brought you here because I want everyone to know about your message. And I love that you took the time to share it. It's so, so many details. Um, yeah, thank you so much. What I want to do is invite everyone, guys, everyone in the audience, please turn on your camera and your mic. Um, Christy and Bryce, you guys are on the gallery view or the speaker view. What are you on? Uh, we are on the speaker view, but I, I can turn to gallery. Yeah, turn to gallery. Guys, everyone who's awake, turn on your camera. <laughs> <laughs> turn on your mic and, and like say something. <laughs> No, I mean, this is a... No. Thank you. There you go. That's what I want to hear. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. You guys are amazing.
Thanks so, so much for coming. It's so great to see so many beautiful faces. So Christy, Bryce, is there like last last thing you want you want to share with with the group? You know, one thing that you want them to to do after they we finish this time. I mean, maybe not tonight, but maybe tomorrow. Like, what's the, the one action you want people to take following this this conversation? I think it's just basically um, the, the key to financial independence is not just like one shot deal and then you're done. I, I see it. I see it as like a marathon, but you got to enjoy the marathon while you're running it. It's like you take little tiny steps and it really adds up over time. Uh, like Sebastian was saying that his, like you started off broke, right? But you started tracking and then tracking and then it, it got better and better and better. And you said near the end, it actually got faster. So it's almost like a snowball where you're like, you're like making a snowball in the beginning. You're like, this is so tiny. It's going to take me forever and it's like what's the point of this but then as you roll it it gets more and more momentum it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and your efforts will compound over time it just doesn't feel like it in the beginning but let's let's all think of this as a, a journey and we're all on this journey together and we need to enjoy the process and it will pay off in the long time it's just like you it doesn't matter where you start as long as you start and over time your efforts will be worth it beautifully said i think this is an amazing place to end this conversation bryce you want to add something to that um fire is not about money it's about freedom so yes <laughs> if you understand if you un like th there was a quote at the beginning of this that, that everyone quotes me over which is if you understand money life is really incredibly easy but if you don't understand money life is incredibly hard and the fact is most people don't understand money like they don't understand like all the nuances of it how to save it what like how to how to invest it how to make it work for you and all this kind of stuff it's not taught in schools it's not really taught anywhere it's up to it's up to us and people like sebastian to uh to fill in the gaps with the education system failed um but once you figure it out everything just becomes like so incredibly easy yeah and just just to add to that like it might sound scary and like there's a lot of knowledge to acquire but really it isn't um it's it, it does take a few weeks or a few months maybe if you have to read a few books and and speak to a few people but like it's it's a mountain in terms of the journey but in terms of acquiring the knowledge to get started is there isn't there isn't that much it's much i mean it's definitely not as much as what the financial industry wants us to believe and like yes you can learn it and like you know christian bryce's website is a great place to start all that um anyone can learn it and, and, it's, and it shouldn't be scary really so hopefully this event helped uh, you know make this a lot more attainable to everyone um and so thanks again you know christian bryce thanks again for being here i wish you a beautiful day a beautiful week a beautiful month and hope to see you soon um yeah, I miss all my Shitaqua friends. I miss you guys. Um, and um, yeah, we, we need to meet up as soon as we can. Oh, yeah. Well, we'll, we'll get together for Belgian beer. Yay! Yes, and yes, waffles and, and fries. Uh, <laughs> yes, please. please. That's the EU to take us off of the bus. Yes, please, please. <laughs> we need to be back in your continent. Yeah. Let's do that. Okay, that's the end of the interview. Um, I mean, it was a fascinating conversation with so much value. We had so much amazing feedback from the audience from this interview. And uh, I hope you're enjoying as well. And I would love to hear back from you. Like, what have you taken away from this interview? Uh, what's what's like one thing that really has is helping you? I, I'd love to hear from you either in the Facebook group or on YouTube in the comments, just let me know um, what you found most useful here. And then again, if you're interested in starting and learning how to get started with index investing in Belgium uh, in the most efficient way, I highly recommend you check um, the free workshop that's on the website uh, with the link in the description. All right, that's it for today. Um, have a good day and uh, I'll speak to you soon. Cheers. <laughs>